thank you all for uh, the opportunity to be here today. Real pleasure to, uh, to talk to this group from whom I always learn so much. Um, I was asked actually today to, uh, to make a sort of combined talk where, where I introduced the, there, there are three related talks we'll be hearing today. And, and uh, if Kevin Leighton Brown is here, you might hear a fourth related talk at some point uh, too. But um, uh, let me just get started on, on what we have here. So the three re related talks today are uh, one by me, where I'm going to give a, a, an introduction to the, whole, uh, uh, to the whole set of things and then talk about the substitution metric. The talk by uh, Ilya Segal on uh, privacy, substitutes, and optimization, and, and the talk by Sheng Wu Li on obviously strategy proof mechanism. There's also related work um, by Kevin Leighton Brown. These are all motivated in part by um, uh, in part by many things, but in part by work that's being done on the so-called U.S. incentive auction, which is um, which I'll tell you about uh, uh, now. So uh, the the things that that set a background for all of this are uh, this this huge auction, which is about to take place, that people estimate. You know, you you read in the newspapers anywhere from 40 to 80 billion dollars worth of transactions. So it's going to be a, a really enormous deal, and. Um, it's uh, just for background so you know what we're talking about. This was uh, something that was conceived in 2010 where the National Broadband Plan in the U.S. said that uh, Congress should consider expressly expanding the FCC's authority to enable it to conduct incentive auctions, that's where the term comes from, in which incumbent licensees may relinquish uh, spectrum rights to other parties or to the FCC. So that was proposed and there's been a whole series of the Spectrum Act in 2012, uh, uh, enabled this. The, uh, uh, there was a notice of proposed rule in 2011 after the National Broadband uh, Plan, but before the Spectrum Auction, I was hired by the FCC to put together a team to begin planning for this. Legislation came in 2012. Um, a notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, which proposed a design that uh, the auctionomics team put together, uh, was, uh, was proposed in 2012. Uh, it was adopted. There was a report and order in 2014 uh, which provide, provided rules for the implementation of the auction and uh, most recently on August 6th, the, uh, the procedures public notice was issued which established the procedures for the auction. So this is gonna happen. First bid will be on March 29th, 2016. Um, and uh, the consultant's contract, I'd like to put this up because it's really daunting. I was asked to sign a contract in September 2011 to put together a team with these design goals listed for the uh, auction. Uh, the, they wanted efficiency, they wanted the net revenues to be adequate, whatever that means. Minim the design should minimize gaming and strategic behavior, uh, avoid windfalls to bidders, uh, be feasible to implement in an acceptable time frame, Participation is voluntary, a group payments constraint, they were paying attention to the core and th thinking about core selecting auctions then. It should be simple to understand and participate and transparent, which I uh, understood to mean easy to audit uh, after the fact, essentially. And those were the, those were the design goals, okay, for, for a 40 to $80 billion auction. So this was a, uh, quite a project. Um, the, uh, what I want to talk to you about is what the novel uh, challenges were in this design. So, uh, because the set of talks that we're going to see involve research, involve um, innovation in uh, f basically four major areas that we'll be talking about. The first is that, um, the first area is that market clearing, this is different than the standard theory of markets. And the standard theory of markets in, in economics, you have supply, you have demand, you have people buying and selling the same thing. So, uh, and you have wheat, you have people selling wheat, you have buying, people buying wheat, you find a market clearing price where supply crosses demand. Here, despite the public think that these guys are just buying and selling radio spectrum, they're not buying and selling the same thing. The, uh, uh, the television broadcast rights look very different than mobile broadband rights. They both use the same resource. They both use the radio spectrum, but they have very different interference properties. They have to be paired in different ways. The, the, the rights are actually completely different. And what has to happen is we have to uh, buy broadcast rights and sell broadband rights and convert them in between. And um, we have to buy 
roughly the same broadcast rights in every part of the United States in order to create a band plan that works with uh, mobile phones. So it's not one good that we're buying, but a collection of complementary goods. And we have to convert them into uh, uh, licenses for broadband in a highly nonlinear way. So it turns out the uh, uh, TV broadcast licenses are these little 6 megahertz chunks of spectrum, and mobile broadband licenses are 10 megahertz chunks of spectrum, 5 megahertz of uplink, and 5 megahertz of downlink. And depending which frequencies you buy, you can create different uh, uh, licenses in different ways. So we have this. Um, this problem of figuring out what market clearing should be. And that's novel in auction design. And uh, we conceive of it as a production problem in which we're buying inputs and selling outputs. The second um, uh, problem is that the production problem is computationally hard. I saw Ke uh, Kevin's over there. I saw Kevin come in. The um, uh, finding TV channels for stations that choose to remain on the air, not sell their rights, is like a graph coloring problem, but with extra constraints. We have, um, you have to assign uh, a TV channel to, well, I'll tell you more about this in detail in a few moments. You have to assign a TV channel to each station that remains on the air so that no two channel adjacent channels, channels that are too close, are assigned, no two adjacent stations are assigned to the same channel. No two adjacent nodes are the same color. It's a, a, like a graph coloring problem, but with extra constraints, of various kinds, uh, domain constraints, or certain channels you can't use near the Canadian border, and certain channels you can't use near, near the Mexican border, and, uh, uh, and there are some uh, adjacent channel, I described to you the main constraints, the so-called co-channel constraints, or other constraints too. So it's similar to a graph coloring problem, it's an NP-complete problem, or a class of problems, but it's um, uh, not a graph coloring problem. Um, Formulating feasibility as a SAT problem, as Kevin did, I understand involves about 600,000 constraints, so it's a large-scale problem, and we'll have to solve a lot of these during the course of a, a auction in real time. So this is, uh, uh, if Kevin gets a chance to talk, uh, it, I don't know when, when you're talking out here, but the, uh, talking about the computational innovations that were done to make this something that we can do is, is one of the elements. Another element is um, to encourage participation Bidding to sell needs to be easy. A lot of the participants in the auction, uh, the, the people that we thought were most likely to sell when we were doing the design were small broadcasters who own, uh, you know, they own channel 34 in Detroit or, you know, channel 27 in Atlanta. And uh, they're, they're small businesses that, that, you know, it's their life business. Maybe they have a couple of channels in a couple of different cities. But they're small broadcasters, not huge. They're not AT&T and Verizon. They have to participate in an auction. It's got to be easy for them, or they won't participate. Uh, they have a real option of not participating and saying, "Gee, we'll let the big guys participate, and we'll sell to somebody after the auction if we're going to sell it all." Uh, and if they don't participate, we won't be able to clear very much spectrum, and we won't be able to achieve the objectives of the national broadband plan. So, um, Shengbu Li is going to talk uh, later today about um, what it means for uh, an auction to be obviously strategy proof. It's going to turn out that uh, if you try to explain this auction, the auction we're doing to bidders, which involves these thousands of NP complete calculations and say, trust me, it's strategy proof, just report truthfully, uh, that doesn't fly. We don't think that uh, everybody's going to say, gee, we trust the government that much that uh, we'll just report truthfully. It has to be not just strategy proof, but obviously strategy proof, and, and Shengwu will tell you more about that um, later. Then the auction algorithm itself needs to perform well. Um, it turns out that this, is, this problem is too big to do optimization. In any way, if you did optimization, what would you, um, what would you tell the bidders? How would the bidders bid? So we want to, uh, we, the auction algorithm, which doesn't involve uh, optimization, has to perform well in some sense. And uh, Ilya will talk about uh, some elements of what that means uh, in his talk later, and I'll talk about some elements of what it means in my talk uh, now. OK. Um, so the, the, I want to talk now about the, uh, for just a, a moment, about the production problem being computationally hard. Um, so this is the, uh, a graph of the interference around one station. So you see here a station um, in the center of the graph. Each node in this graph is a UHF TV station. 
uh, each arc in the graph is a pair of stations that cannot be assigned to the same channel. The, uh, when, if you think about this as a graph coloring problem, these are the main kinds of constraints uh, that we have. And uh, you see quite a bit of complexity. The other nodes in the graph, the white nodes that you see here, are things that are within two, two uh, steps from the, uh, from the central node. It's, it's a pretty complex mess. And uh, this is a spring-loaded graph um, showing the overall U.S. interference structure. You can see a little bit in this graph. The spring-loading, I think you guys all know what spring-loading algorithms are. You try to pull together things that are connected. You try to push apart things that are not connected and reveal something of the structure of the graph. And you can see a little bit. You can see that um, around cities, there's, this is going on in here too, but you can see it out here. Around cities, everything interferes with everything else. You know, we have uh, some number of channels in New York City, and if you have uh, 20 channels, 20 stations in New York City, no two of those can be on the same channel. Every, everyone interferes. Those are clicks in the graph. Everyone um, interferes with every other. But there's just this huge mass of things that are, uh, that are connected in a complex way that make this, say, uh, a hard problem um, to solve in principle. The auction uh, will probably need to solve more than 100,000. We don't really know yet. Uh, but it's going to need to solve a lot of these problems, and it's going to need to solve them in real time. OK. Um, the third thing I want to talk about is, is market clearing being, so this is all the introduction, introductory part, the long introduction, but the overall scope of what the project is. It's a big project that's been going on for several years. The, the market clearing involves a production problem. So um, how, do we, how are we going to do market clearing? OK, now conceptually, I, I'm going to do this at two levels for you. I'm going to start off first with the idea that somehow or another spectrum is uniform, which it's not. But just to give you conceptually what, what the concept, what the idea is. So what we're going to do is, based on the applications to participate in the auction, we're going to say, what's the largest number of channels we could hope to clear? Uh, suppose we decide you know, we can clear 126 megahertz of spectrum. Each, that's 21 channels. Each channel is 6 megahertz. So we set up a, a quantity target. And somewhere out of sight, there is we think of there as being like a supply curve, which is this upward sloping curve here, and a demand curve, which is the downward sloping curve. That is, if you offer, this is the usual economist thing, quantities on the x-axis, prices on the y-axis, uh, if you offer a higher price, you're going to, uh, you're going to get a larger, uh, larger quantity supplied, but a smaller quantity demanded. So that's, that's what, the, uh, what the graph shows. And uh, what we'll do is we'll announce that, and we'll start an auction in which prices um, fall in the reverse auction gradually and rise in the forward auction. So they fall and rise. And um, what we discover here is, gee, uh, we can't clear that much because the uh, price we're getting uh, from the buyers in the forward auction is less than the price we're paying to the sellers in the reverse auction, we're suffering a loss. So what the algorithm is, we'll say, gee, that was too ambitious. We will reduce the quantity and let the price in the reverse auction continue to fall and in the forward auction continue to rise, but we still have a loss. And then we'll reduce the target further and we'll let the price continue to fall in the reverse auction and continue to rise in the forward auction. We have a revenue target we have to meet. Um, we have to pay the broadcasters who stay on the air, have to retune. They'll have retuning costs roughly $2 billion. We have to raise $2 billion in profit at least to cover the, um, uh, the, the relocation costs of the, of the bidders who don't sell their spectrum. So we have a net revenue target. Um, and. Um, there's some other restrictions here, too, which I'll wait. But that's roughly the concept. This is what economists call Marshallian dynamics, where, the, uh, where it's adjusting quantity and letting the, forward, the, the buy price and the sell price adapt to a quantity to find, the, uh, to find market clearing. The actual process looks like this. It, it's very similar. This is the graph from the, um, from the FCC's notice. There's a reverse auction in which prices fall, a forward auction in which prices rise. But there are different prices for different stations in different parts of the country. It's not all one product. Still, we're, we're trying to clear some number of channels in San Francisco, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, Boston, everywhere. And, uh, uh, and we have these auctions going on, which I'll describe in some more detail. There's a cost associated with those. 
We have forward auction, which we're selling licenses in different parts of the country. There's revenue associated with those. And the, the concept is exactly what I showed you um, a moment ago. OK. OK. The, um, yeah. Targets are local or global? Yeah, the target's global. There's one, so we, we're trying to clear. So you're basically to get money from Chicago to cover everything else in the country. Oh, in principle, it's the totals that matter. You're, the, these devices are, are set up so that they have to know something about what frequencies they're going to be using. So we have to say, you know, these channels are being cleared for uh, uplink out of your phone. These channels are, are going to be used for downlink out of your phone. And they have to be the same pretty much. There's some filtering things you can do, but they have to be pretty much the same across the whole country. Um, tr uh, for simplification, let's just say they have to be exactly the same across the whole country. And um, so, uh, so we're getting different prices, and we add them up. We're, we have perfect complements, if you will, on the supply side and perfect complements on the demand side. And it's the total prices that are being compared. But you said, uh, no, the reason I'm asking is that you said that prices are going to move, to move differently in different parts of the country. Yes. What determines this? I'm going to show you. I will show you. Okay. We're going there, OK? So the, um, we'll get there. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to give you right now uh, an overview of what the, what the challenges were in the design and what the research challenges were, what kinds of solutions we're coming up with. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the research. Yeah. Perfect compliments was the demand on the supply side. And I see the demand side complement. I don't see the supply side complement. Well, so in order to clear channel 27, let's suppose I want to clear channels 31 to 51, for example. Um, then I have to have that much free spectrum in every city, in Chicago, Los Angeles, Detroit. That's the supply side. Um, OK, so, uh, so I have to buy um, uh, channels. But that's not the sellers of compliments. No, no, it's not this. It's us. The uh, the FCC in in the in its production problem, the FCC's problem. These are perfect co the complements, right? And is it clear which way you move? Like, I mean, say you have the core spectrum from 40 to 50 megahertz. Would you know in which direction to move to expand, or is that also? No. So we've uh, so we decided that in advance. We're gonna we're gonna clear down from channel 51. Channel 51 is the highest channel that's currently used for broadcast television. We're going to clear some set of channels down from 51. Part of what makes this nonlinear, by the way, is uh, so the, as, as you clear down, there, there are guard bands that you have to put in uh, between the uh, uplink and the downlink. And then ch at channel 37 is set aside for medical devices and radio astronomy. And if you clear down below channel 37, then you need to the production involves putting a guard band above and below channel 37. It's, it's really very nonlinear, the, the, uh, the conversion from, um, uh, from channels cleared to, uh, to broadband spectrum created. Yeah. Suppose in one city in the United States, no one wants to participate, then everything goes away, or there's a way no, to force them to sell it? They can be forced them. To no, but one, you know, one city, no one wants to sell anything because, you know, they don't So the, the um, OK. So, um, in the simplified version I'm giving you, uh, if that happens, the, the, uh, we wouldn't be able to sell. In fact, another one of the challenges was how to deal with that. And, we have, and I'm not going to talk about that today, but that's a separate challenge. Um, the, the way we're getting, the way we hope to get people to participate is the part of this design is the opening prices are very high. Um, the, the, as when we announced the, uh, the tentative opening prices, you know, there were all these people who said, oh, there's no way we'll sell our television station. This is our business. We're Fox. We're a Fox affiliate. We're an NBC affiliate. We're never going to sell these stations. And then we posted tentative opening prices. $900 million in Los Angeles, you know, was a, 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 the kind of opening price. People, $900 million. And, and imagine you have a station in Los Angeles, and um, this is over-the-air television, so you need to know that uh, in the United States, 90% of people get their, uh, their broadcast signal either through cable or satellite. And uh, so even if you got shut off, you'd still have 90% of your customers left. We're talking about 10% of your customers, $900 million. This is completely outrageous. Uh, everybody is interested. Fox is interested. CBS is interested. Everybody's interested at the opening prices. So, so we do expect that we'll have enough interest at the opening prices, but it may turn out that those prices are too high for AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and so on. 
in which case the process will continue. But we do expect to be able to clear uh, almost uniformly. Uh, there are some areas that are problematic, but uh, almost uniformly. Okay, um, to encourage participation, bidding to sell needs to be easy, so that's what Sheng Wu is going to talk about, but, um, uh, but I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about that. So uh, one of the things that was talked about at the very beginning was the possibility of Vickrey auctions. You guys all know what Vickrey auctions are. Um, but the problem with Vickrey auctions, or a problem with Vickrey auctions, is you can't even estimate these prices accurately. So, so uh, each Vickrey price is the difference between two numbers. It's between the total value of the continuing broadcasters with or without one station. It's the incremental contribution of a station uh, to, to total value. With 2,000 stations, a 1% computation error in the optimization leads to a, on average a 2,000% pricing error in estimating the Vickery price. Um, and uh, including, as we found in the data, where the FCC had lots of calculations and we found a whole bunch of negative prices where uh, we'll, uh, we'll take your station if you pay us for it, you know, the, uh, because the, you know, we get big pricing errors. And, you know, testing with CPLEX and Gorobi, the, the best guarantees that emerged, they ran these things for weeks, uh, attempting to do optimizations. The, they had a team of operations researchers formulating the questions. They got performance, they could guarantee 97% of the optimum um, after, you know, weeks of computation. It just, this just isn't good enough to calculate uh, Vickery prices. Even if they could be calculated accurately, victory prices are going to be awfully hard to explain to bidders and for bidders to verify. So, Ava, I, I'm going to buy your station and I've decided your price is $10 million. And you say, where did you come up with that number? And I, well, I did this calculation. I ran Garobi for weeks. I'm the government. Trust me. You know, the, um, it, it's just, you know, and then explaining the calculation. It's, it's really tough. So, so uh, we decided we needed something different than that. Again. Uh, Sheng Wu has a, has a deeper treatment of this that you'll hear a little later. Um, so we settled on an alternative, on an alternative greedy-based procedure, which I'll, you'll, some of you have already heard about, these deferred acceptance auctions. And uh, the, one of the big surprises, and this is what the, I want to talk about when I get to the technical part uh, later today, is that how well this performed. You know, it, in, in the 90s of percent of, of the value that the optimization ob, uh, obtained, it, uh, we got really high uh, percentage, um, uh, percentages from just a greedy procedure, and that was a big surprise. And um, so it was a big surprise because, I, I, so again, I, I've learned a bunch of stuff from computer scientists. I see all these worst case bounds. Worst case bounds, if you don't have substitutes, uh, if you don't have the right structure and your constraints. If your constraints don't form a matroid, uh, the, 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 the worst case bounds are terrible, right? And, uh, and here we're getting these things in the 90s of percents, and why is that happening? So, um, okay. So, um, to explain the, um, hey, Kevin, here's my call out to you. Thank you for letting me use your slides on this. The, uh, uh, to explain the algorithm for the reverse auction, um, Kevin has a, a, a beautiful analogy, which is uh, airline overbooking. So the, the idea is that we have, uh, we've already sold seats, so to speak. That is, we have stations that are on the air. We've given them the right to be on the air. We need to get them to give up their seats to move off the air. And so uh, Kevin turned this into an airline overbooking example. We have, um, oh, and, and I will say, we'll come a little bit more to this. If, if you're uh, just thinking about algorithms um, uh, and you want to talk, you have a knapsack problem or something like that, you can think of the problem of putting things in the knapsack or leaving things out of the knapsack. You're basically just sorting things into two groups uh, subject to some constraints. You, you don't tend to think algorithmically of there being a big difference between putting things in and taking things out. But in economics, there is a big difference between those two things because it's the bids that we accept, the category that we call the accepted bids, those are the people that get paid. And uh, the bids that we reject, those are the people that don't get paid. And so the incentives um, are different for, um, for algorithms where uh, we decide who to reject in a greedy fashion 
and who to accept in a greedy fashion. So even though algorithmically you may not see much distinction, uh, in terms of incentives there is a distinction, and uh, so you, you may want to pay a little bit of attention to that as we move along. So here's the airline overbooking problem. We start off, this is, uh, if you like, uh, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, we have, or it's first class business class, economy class. We have um, uh, people who already have seats, and there's plenty of seats for everybody. But somebody decides we need a smaller plane. We have to, we're going to use uh, the big plane for something else. And so all of a sudden, we have a bunch of people that don't have seats. Okay, and the airline has to find seats for these people. And uh, so, and, and it's, it doesn't have room for everybody, so it offers compensation. It says $1,000, I'll give $1,000, so this is an auction. I'm tentatively offering $1,000 uh, for people who will give up their seat on the plane. And a whole bunch of people say, great, I'll take $1,000 to give up my seat on the plane, and all these people move off. Well, now we have more people off than we need. Uh, there's, still, there's empty seats with $1,000, there's empty seats in first class, business class, economy class. So we say, oops, we don't need uh, quite so many people. We're lowering our offer to $800. This is our descending auction. And a bunch of people say, oops, well, sorry, I'm going back. So we now have a bunch of people back on the plane. And notice now that first class is full. So we can't afford to have any of these people go back. We need them. So we don't lower the offer to them. We fix their price at $800. Uh, and say, okay, you guys, we're taking you. Your price is $800, but these other prices are going down. So we offer $600, and a bunch of people move back. We still have space. We offer $500, more people move back. Now, business class is full. Say, so, gee, we, now these two guys, we can't afford for them to change their minds. We're going to freeze their price at $500. They've agreed to take $500, but we lower the price to $400 for economy, and then to $300, there's still empty space, to $250. Now, economy class is full as well. We freeze the price at $250, and we have different prices. So this is a partial answer to your question. This is only part of the answer. But we have different prices in different parts of the country based on who is willing to sell and based on our feasibility constraints. Okay, here the feasibility constraints do form a matroid. They're really simple, uh, and the, uh, and consequently, this actually, um, and by the way, if this is New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, uh, you see how we determine prices for stations in each of the uh, different areas. Okay, yeah? You also take your prices up during the process? You can no, it can only go down, and they're going down by smaller increments than I showed you. So, so there is no chance that there will be too much demand? Right? right, there's no chance that there'll be too much demand. The, the, uh, we process. So it, it, we actually process the, the station sequentially, one at a time. And so the, what, would, what actually goes on in the auction is uh, over here, uh, when we lower the prices from 300 to 200 to 250, one station at a time uh, during the processing in the auction. And if you are frozen, uh, that is, if we don't have space for you while your price is still 300, then we pay you 300. So we don't necessarily get exactly equal prices for everybody in economy class in our processing. Okay, it's actually sequential. That way we never overshoot. Okay, so um, this, now, now notice that, suppose this, these calculations were complicated. I have to figure out whether I have space for you. I have to solve a graph coloring problem to figure out is there any way to assign you a channel? So it's a complicated calculation. Nevertheless, you can figure out that this is strategy proof for you. I've just offered you, you know, $1,000 for a seat that's worth $350 to you. you. Say, you know, well, maybe he'll lower the price, maybe he won't, but I'm not going to say no to $1,000. So uh, it's strategy proof for you, even though you don't understand the algorithm. So that's, uh, that's one of the things we wanted to do. Um, it's obviously strategy proof. That's roughly speaking what I said in the sense that Shengwu will make precise. It's weekly group strategy proof, which means that um, if there's no transfers allowed between the participants, there's no joint deviation that any group of bidders can adopt that's strictly profitable for all of them. So unless the bidders collude and make side payments, uh, they, there, there's, no, uh, there's no group deviation that's strictly profitable for all the participants. Um, yeah. In practice, do you, uh, do you think they will collude? 
Oh yeah. Well, the the uh, so we so in practice, boy, the time is really ticking on me here. The um, um, can I take that offline? Because the, there there are, there's all sorts of other issues that have to do with uh, channel sharing technologies. Bidders who go off air might choose to share a channel. Then they have to be able to talk to each other. But once they can talk to each other, how do you? stop them from talking about the bids in the auction. So these things are tricky. And we actually did a lot of work on that. That's part of the economics that I won't talk about today. Um, algorithmically, this is a greedy rejection uh, uh, algorithm, which is to say that as prices go down, what's happening is that bids are being rejected. These are people who are not going to be paid. They're moving onto the plane rather than, uh, so, so what's happening is that I am greedily rejecting stations. And that, uh, that's important from, it's not algorithmically important, but it's important from the standpoint of analyzing incentives. OK. Uh, to run quickly, because time is really running off on me, call a set of bids independent if it's uh, possible to find seats or TV channels for the rejected bidders. In the airline example, the collection of independent sets that I just showed you is a matroid. It's just, uh, the, uh, consequently, this greedy rejections algorithm does implement an efficient outcome. And uh, consequently, because the Vickery auction is the only strategy proof auction that implements the efficient outcome, it follows that the prices that are coming out of this are Vickery prices. Um, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to jump over. There's, there's some closely related work in computer science and economics. The, uh, um, the, these guys, it's the, in the overbooking problem, it's the bids that the auction rejects, not the ones that ex accepts that are processed greed, greedily. That's a distinction of this from the previous work. Um, but there, this previous work is closely related, and I won't say more about it given the time. Um, OK, the auction algorithm needs to perform well. I have only 10 minutes left, so let's, uh, let's do a little bit of this. So um, from airlines to the FCC, so our auction is not exactly the same as what I explained to you. Here's the, here are the main differences. First of all, the, the price that's offered to a bidder in any round is, is not the same for all bidders. It's not just the clock price. Rather, it's the clock price multiplied by some bidder-specific constant. And that bidder-specific constant depends on the population coverage that the bidder has and the number of stations with which it interferes. So uh, we are trying to, uh, to offer higher prices to pull out stations that cause a lot of interference. There's a knapsack-like character, we think, to part of the problem. And we want to get rid of the stations that take up a lot of space, so to speak. And we don't want to overpay small stations. We think we can get small stations to, uh, to exit for lower prices, so we take into account the population of the station in making the offers. This, that's a, if you like, that's a price discrimination trick that's built into the uh, design. And, uh, that's probably the wrong language to use, but we are offering prices that are dependent on the um, uh, uh, on, on population. Um, the, the thing I want to talk to you about, I guess, the technical piece I want to talk to you about is approximate matroid. So. What I've learned from you guys when, you know, when I hear about um, algorithms is if you don't have one structure, let's try another structure. Let's move away from gross substitutes to submodularity to something else where, where you go from one structure to the other. And you know, as an economist, the way economists tend to think about this is a little different. And I wanted to see if I could formalize that. That I, I wanted to think that this, this idea, you know, it's not substitutes exactly, it's not a matroid exactly, but maybe it's close to being a matroid in some sense. Is there a metric that tells me how close this thing is to being a matroid that tells me how well a greedy algorithm would perform? So that's the kind of way I wanted to approach uh, the problem. Uh, because if, I don't want to say as soon as you take one constraint that kills the matroid structure that a greedy algorithm won't perform well. So. Um, Given a collection of independent set C, the goal is to, uh, to find a larger collection, which I'll call the outer bound, MO for outer, uh, and a smaller collection, MI, which is the inner bound, uh, with MI in C uh, in MO. And then to build an auction that's equivalent to running a greedy algorithm on MI, um, find the optimum for that overly constrained problem, and then relax the constraints uh, to continue to fill C. 
Now, if, if M i and M o are close to each other, then uh, they're close to C. I know that the greedy algorithm gets me an exact optimum on M i, that the greedy algorithm gets me an exact optimum on M o, that the value of M i and M o are close, and therefore I would be getting an approximate optimum for C. And if I could metrize the distance between M i and M o, I would be telling you something about how well the greedy algorithm could perform, okay? So that's the general idea, and with only a few minutes, that here's, a, uh, here's some hierarchy-based matroids and the reason that I'm using them. So I'll say that a collection of, so I have a ground set G, like if you like the set of TV stations or the set of, uh, of uh, passengers, and I have subsets of that, and that set forms a hierarchy if for any two uh, elements, any two sets in the collection, Either one's a subset of the other or they're disjoint. So that was the case in the uh, first class business class coach example that we looked at a moment ago. Um, I'm going to say, given some notation, uh, uh, given a, uh, this hierarchy and given any function from the hierarchy to the um, uh, natural numbers including zero, uh, I'm going to say that MFH, so this is going to be my matroid approximation using this function H and this bound, uh, uh, this function F and this uh, collection H, is the, um, uh, is the collection of sets, such that, uh, sets S, such that the size of the intersection, the number of elements in the intersection of S with B is less than or equal to F of B for all B in the hierarchy. Okay, so that's a hierarchy which is defined by a bunch of inequality bounds. This is a, uh, a, a set that's defined by a bunch of inequality bounds. And the, uh, and the theorem is for this collection of sets MFH is a, matri is a matroid for all functions F if and only if this collection H is a hierarchy. Okay, so this is a, um, so the reason I'm using hierarchies is that when you impose bounds in this way, this is the, uh, uh, if you impose bounds in this way and you don't know what the bounds are going to be in advance, you, you want to determine the set F, you need the collection H to be a hierarchy. Okay, so given a family of independent sets and a hierarchy, um, I'm going to define a bounding function this way. I'm going to let B of S be the, uh, the maximum of, for, for all T in, in my collection of S uh, intersect T. So, uh, by construction, uh, C is in M of H and B. So the, the, by, I've taken this bound so that it's just big enough to, uh, uh, to not constrain anything that's actually in the, uh, the real constraint set. And then I'm going to define, so that's for my outer bounding set. That's going to give me my outer bound. And then I'm going to define B row of S um, to be, I'm going to take row times this outer bound and where rho is, an, is enough that if I shrink the outer bound enough, I, uh, I get an inner bound on C. And I'm going to use rho to measure how close I am. If rho is 1, then the, the original set is a hierarchy and therefore is a matroid and I'm done. And uh, if rho is 0, I mean some rho will work, 0 will always work here because the, uh, if, I'm, if I don't impose any constraints, I'm fine. So the, uh, I'll always get an inner bound if I, have the, if, if I don't take any elements at all. So uh, given these values for each item, you can then apply the standard greedy algorithm to this inner approximation, relax and continue the greedy algorithm. And what you'll get is that this, this algorithm obtains at least a 1 minus rho star um, fraction of the maximum value of the problem. Uh, with these constraints, which is the outer bound constraints, and consequently with the actual constraints. The, the, so optimizing just on the inner bound gives me this fraction 1 minus rho of what I get if I optimized on the outer bound. And since the actual constraints are between the inner and the outer bound, I must be getting at least 1 minus rho of, um, uh, of the actual constraints as well. Okay. And uh, the, the point is then that there is a deferred acceptance, uh, there is a descending auction where I descend prices separately to each station where I do it in that way so that I'm greedily selecting the stations in MI and, um, and then continuing to reduce prices to uh, continue to apply the constraints in C. And so there is a, a deferred acceptance auction, a descending price auction 
uh, that implements this, and it's obviously strategy proof in the sense that Shengwu is going to define for you um, uh, a little later. Okay, and uh, I don't really have time. You can also mix matroids. I, what I really want to be able to do, this is all research in progress, is mix matroids and knapsacks in, in a greedy algorithm. This is a uh, uh, not a particularly good description of what goes on in the FCC problem, but it's my first attempt to mix uh, uh, matroid and knapsack constraints. So uh, imagine that this, the ground set is partitioned into uh, a collection of items G1 through GK, and that I have associated matroid constraints within each one of these ground sets. And I have um, sizes, if you will. Um, I probably should have used S for sizes, but uh, uh, WK is the size of a station in, uh, in ground set K. And suppose I have this additional uh, knapsack-like constraint. So the idea is that in the FCC auction, some stations cause a lot of interference. They interfere with a lot of other stations. Some stations cause very little interference. Let's imagine that that's a characteristic of the area that the station's in, that stations in Detroit or stations in uh, Chicago. Um, as I say, this isn't necessarily a good description of the real FCC problem, but suppose that that's a characteristic of the uh, stations in the area, and suppose that if I, that I fail to be a matroid only because of these other constraints. That if there's if there's not too much interference, that I can find a coloring. Uh, then I can use a the the kind of greedy algorithm that's used in the knapsack problem, where you look at value per size, respecting both the knapsack and the matroid constraints. And suppose that you stop this wastefully the first time that the knapsack constraint uh, causes a rejection. Um, if the remaining space in the knapsack at termination is sigma then the algorithm performance is at least 1 minus sigma over k. Um, it's the same bound that you get from any knapsack problem. But instead of the items all being individual, I have, uh, for each item, I have another group of matroid constraints uh, on them. So this, uh, moreover, there is a descending clock auction that implements this algorithm. So um, uh, I can run a clock auction that achieves good efficiency um, uh, and respects simultaneously a knapsack type constraint and matroid type constraints. Okay, so the object is to uh, try to explain good performance in a certain class of applications as the, why, why, does, why did matroid constraints make sense? Well, remember we had these uh, in, the, in the airline overbooking, we had first class, uh, business class coach. In the, in, the re, in the radio spectrum allocation problem, we have Chicago, which is a uh, um, uh, um, which is a click. All those things interfere with one another. I can have a constraint that if I, I, if I have 15 channels available, I can't have more than 15 stations in Chicago. I have a lot of constraints like that, and to the extent that those are the most important constraints on the problem, I can uh, hope to uh, uh, that some kind of greedy algorithm in this class will, uh, will perform well, taking those constraints into account. So. That's, I'm almost out of time, so I guess I'll stop here and take questions. Sergio. Uh, just before we went to the matroid, you, you said something on the fact that the clocks or the prices are running differently for different stations. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, I can understand that if those di if different. So, uh, there is a fairness issue here that perhaps uh, <laughs> fairness that, you know, they may go to court and challenge what you are doing. Now, they, they cannot challenge if those are different markets, but two stations that are in exactly the same area, one is in 27 and one is in 35, and 35 is much more problematic because of the other, uh, of the other constraints, why should they be paid? 1,000 when the other in 27 is paid 500, where they are making exactly the same profit, they have the same coverage, it just uh, you know, they were allocated different numbers. So your, your, your intuition about what people will challenge is completely wrong. The, the, um, that's not, nobody challenges that part. Everybody understands that what the FCC needs to do is to eliminate stations that are causing interference that keep it from, um, uh, that keep it from um, clearing as much spectrum as they like. The challenges that came up were the other kind, where people said, gee, uh, you know, you need me just as badly as you need him. How come you're paying me less just because I serve a smaller population? You know, it's uh, 
So the, the challenges are actually very different than the one you, you mentioned. And the FCC is a governmental entity, and it has a, uh, if you read in the report and order, it, uh, it takes the, all the comments into account. There are people that challenge it, and there are other people that say, well, you know, uh, other TV stations that say, you know, population coverage is one of the main things we use in figuring out our valuation, so that seems appropriate. And the FCC says, we've looked at comments from both sides, and we've decided to keep the rule that we proposed. So. Uh, <laughs> yep, that's that's what the report and order says. Okay, so it's a, yeah. So just one uh, addition to that. Actually, it is not true that two stations who are identical but just happen to be on different channels they will be offered different prices, because we really they can be retuned. So the initial channel really doesn't matter to us. And so if you have two stations that are exactly identical, have exactly the same coverage and exactly the same <coughs> interference constraints <coughs> on any possible channel where they might be assigned then they would be offered exactly the same prices up for this one decrement because of the you know, random processing due, uh, uh, to break the ties. So, so Ilya heard a different question than I heard, so just to reconcile these two things. The, the, uh, it's not that they're on a different channel. I, I heard you saying they had different population coverages. Uh, same population coverage. Oh, then it doesn't matter what channel they're on because we can, uh, uh, we can, we can move them into different seats. No, no, no. It said, it said there. It said there. Uh, there the number of interstations with which. Yeah, but that's not that's not determined uh, based on the channel that you're on. That's determined based on the channels you could be on. Uh, because we're going to re, we're reassigning. Uh, everybody's getting new channels. The, we have to take everybody who's. Uh, let's say if we clear channel 31 to 51, everybody who's on a channel above channel 31 will be moved to and stays on the air will be moved to a channel below channel 31. And to make room for them, we have, may have to move some other people around too. You, you don't have a right to the channel you're on. You only have a right to a broadcast channel in the UHF band. No. When you say same population, the actual number of viewers that they have over the air? No, no, the, uh, the population that's covered in their service area. The service area of all stations in Detroit is not the same? No, you know, in Chicago, the, the, the stations are all broadcasting from the top of the Willis Tower. And if they, if they tune their antennas in the same direction, they'll, they'd have the same coverage. But the, if you could be in a different location. The, the, lo the antennas are partly directional. They did that because at the time they were setting up, they didn't want to cause interference with somebody else. So they tuned their station in a certain way. So they, start with, they can start with different population coverages. That's already determined now, or only when the auction starts, or after the. No, it's we know it now. They uh, they have licenses so they now. They can't move their antenna now to a better location, which would give them more. No, 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 no. They have a li they have a license now that tells them what what area they're intended to cover without interference, at broadcast at a certain power without interference in a certain area. That's all fixed. Yeah. yeah. So in the overbooking example, <clears throat> isn't there a problem if I own multiple seats? <laughs> yes, um, absolutely right. So the, the, uh, w we designed this auction with the small broadcasters in mind. Um, if you own multiple seats in the same area, that is in, in, uh, in the overbooking example, if you own multiple first class seats or multiple coach seats or multiple business class seats, in other words, if you own multiple television stations in the same city, uh, then you do have some market power and it's not strategy proof. Um, and. Uh, uh, we were designing with the small broadcasters in mind to make it easy for them. It turns out that most of the big broadcasters own only one station in each city, but there are some places where, the, where this is a problem, and, uh, and market power is a problem for us in those places. Yes? But you cannot own more than two stations in each market now by the FCC rules. Also, if you own two, you may not necessarily consider selling both of them. You, know, you might want just to sell one and not sell the other, so the cases where you want to exercise market power, where you, the choice is to sell two versus to sell one, they might happen, but then from the not very common. So what you lose is, I would have sold two, but I'm going to draw one of them back in time to get more from the other one. Yeah, so yeah that's, that's, the, that's the risk, yes. All right, well, thank you, everybody.